Hi there, uh, welcome to another Grain and Grape video. Uh, it wouldn't be a Grain and Grape video without a half working tape gun going off in the background. My name's Joel, I work at Grain and Grape uh, and today I'm joined by Ben, who too works at Grain and Grape. Hey Ben, how you going? Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Today we're trying something new. We thought we'd try a series of videos where we answer your questions from the comment section. Um, starting with questions from our How to No Chill tutorial. If you want to know what No Chill is, uh, check out the links up here and down there. So if you have no idea what we're talking about, maybe go check that out first and then pop back. We will expand uh, to more topics down the line. So if you're curious about where all this might be heading, um, consider subscribing and you know we'll go on this journey together and we'll see where we go. Okay, so with that business out of the way, let's get on to the, the topic of the day. Ben, um, <laughs> a brewer has just learned the no-chill method. Yeah. And one of the first, well, arguably one of the first questions that tends to pop up pop up after they've learnt it is can I just chill directly in my plastic fermenter? Technically? Is it technically? You can do a lot of things. <laughs> it's more a matter of whether you should, I guess. But Yeah, right. A lot of these questions, the, the answer is probably going to be technically yes, but is it a good idea? You know, I guess it's a natural thing um, that people want to do. They want to refine the method and, and uh, uh, maybe save a few minutes or hours. One less thing to clean. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so plastic fermenters, maybe we can talk a bit about those because other regions in the world don't all use plastic. For example, North America, the way they brew is uh, within the glass carboys. Mm. Uh, so if you're watching from the States, this may not apply so much. Um, I wouldn't be putting boiling wort in a glass Boy, it's probably not a good idea, is it? Probably a little bit, yeah, sketchy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want it to shatter, yeah, especially, if it's, shatter. especially if it's a particularly cold day or something like that. Um, introducing boiling hot word into a sub freezing glass carboy could result in some serious injury, yeah, for sure. So, um, glass probably not a good idea, but for those of us using plastic, uh, here in Australia and I, I think maybe in parts of Europe, I'm not sure, but. Uh, plastic fermenters have kind of become uh, just just part of the, the done thing. An introductory sort of um, way to get some gear. It's not too expensive. Yeah. Um, it's not perfect in terms of um, so stainless and glass are really easy to keep clean. Yeah. Um, plastic, you kind of can, but it's you got to be a lot more diligent, and it may not last. Depending on the type of plastic, uh -huh. depending on the fermenter, it may not last as long, um, you, you're probably going to eventually need to replace it. Um, but you're talking, in a lot of cases, a tenth of the price mm. of a stainless fermenter. Um, so, yeah, ten, and I, ten, yeah. 10 purchases of plastic ones for every one purchase of a stainless one, you, you can kind of, it it's a good way to get started. And the reason why I guess it's caught on down here is cost. Australia is on the bottom of the planet, pretty much. Everything is expensive to get here. And, and, and Big, and large, plastic just chunky its way. country as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that's how, in the States, that the carboys, the glass carboys were what was available. They were cheap, and that's what caught on over there. Plastic is what we have here. So plastic fermenters, generally, they're made out of HDPE. Most of the time. Most of the time. Again, it depends on the fermenter. Um, we're seeing a lot more now of the um, uni tanks and like the pressurized yep. plastic fermenting vessels. I think a lot of those are PE, which is a different type of plastic. And, and I guess we'll probably get to that as well because yep. there, there'll be a different answer yes. or different reasons for our answers um, for those versus the HDPE. So the HDPE, high density polyethylene, thank you, um, which is the same plastic generally that's the cubes are made of. Yes. No chilling found its way to those cubes because they can withstand the temperatures yeah. um, of the hot work going in there. Plastic fermenters, so they're made of the same thing. People naturally think, okay, well, I can just chill in there. Um, it's, it's a sensible thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of types. We've got the standard old white ones, which are pretty common. You find them everywhere. Uh, we also have the spiral ones we that we stock here, which are a, a little bit more fancy. Germany. Yeah, made of the same stuff. And I have seen a couple of questions online about people asking whether they can no chill in those. So, the drawbacks potentially. Um, let's just 
go through some of the possible ones. Firstly, a fermenter is not airtight. So is that a problem when no chilling? You're gonna be in that danger zone temperature wise um, uh -huh. for a decent amount of time where bacteria can easily get in, but before you're ready to pitch your yeast. Yep. Um, and I think having it in something which can suck air in from mm -hmm. outside is fraught with risk. Probably should touch on what we were, we were saying about the danger zone. Mm. Um, as where it calls, when it's in a, a cube, it's safely contained and pasteurized, in theory, airtight. But as it cools, it's gonna drop, the temperature's gonna drop down through that 40, Any, 30 yeah, anywhere degree. anywhere from sort of 40 down, really. Maybe yeah. even 50, depending 50. on the bacteria. Uh -huh. We're talking Celsius, of course. Um, so apologies to our North American viewers. You obviously don't want any food products sitting in that range um, for an extended period. So there's a risk of contamination um, by sucking in air from the outside through a fermenter as it cools. Even if you do have a lid without a hole in it, mm -hmm. as that work cools, it's gonna contract and then that's gonna... It'll naturally want, oh yeah, it'll collapse the fermenter yeah, as well a bit. Potentially, yeah, potentially. because you've okay. got so much space in yeah. there. I think that's probably gonna be the biggest mm. drawback to, to having sort of like a, a half to two thirds full fermenter with your boiling word as you know, chill. Perhaps also other things to think about are over time, putting hot liquid into, into your fermenters is going to degrade the seals and yeah. all the, the threads and stuff that you got in there, isn't it? So yeah. you might wear out your fermenter sooner. You, yeah, you'll be going thing. through them quicker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But also given that they're plastic threads, the, 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 the tap on your plastic fermenter, uh, if that, if the integrity of that degrades over time because of heat, the last thing you want is to have your fermenter sitting on a bench or your floor somewhere chilling and then that tap pops out and you come in the next day to find a room flooded yep. with wet. So yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the fermenter beer. itself, um, the thickness of the, of the walls of it are enough to, to deal with heat probably, mm. but yeah, the, the fine little yeah, that runs on the threads on yeah, the taps and I stuff. Could, I could see one of those taps popping out really easily actually. Definitely yeah, given enough warp. heat. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've just talked about how you could technically, well, you can put quite hot liquid into a HDPE fermenter. What about the new style uni tanks that are out there? That's a firm <laughs> no. no. That's a firm no. no. Um, yeah, so the PET that they use to make them, um, if you put I mean, they've, they've got uh, instructions that you can access on the manufacturing mm. websites and things like that, and all of those instructions very emphatically saying yeah. not to put anything in over a certain temperature. Yeah. Um, it will warp and otherwise deform the plastic. Yeah, yeah. If you could find that uh, your beer is um, quite rapidly leaving your fermenter in various different directions. Mm. And it's not all, it's not very, it's like 50 odd degrees or something? Or yeah, it's not it's hot. Not, it's, it's not, not hot. hot. So even, even when cleaning, you've got to be very careful. Tap water can get up to like 70 degrees yeah. Celsius. So refer to your instructions on those. You might be tempted to think, you know, yeah, they're airtight. I could no chill in that, but no, 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 stop. <laughs> stop. No. <laughs> can you no chill in a keg? Theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another question that's come up. Um, kegs made of stainless steel can hold high temperatures, in theory, airtight. Uh, checking all the boxes. Um, yeah. Can handle I mean, pressure. Yeah. Um, again, the, I, I guess the one drawback, if there was one, um, goes back to what you were um, talking about with the fermenters and the cubes, mm. is that your soft parts on your keg. They're gonna wear out. They're gonna wear out with the heat. Um, yep. So your, your O-rings on your posts and your dip tubes and your, um, and your lids. Um, yeah. Again, they're not the most expensive thing to replace. Yep. Um, but it is worth keeping in mind because they're the failure points generally um, that are going to cause gas leaks and unsanitary kegs and those sorts of things. So. Yeah, radio, and also probably worth noting that those 
seals are generally made of rubber. So, so, so yeah. we actually sell the, the silicon um, O-rings for the keg lids. Yeah, right. Which does handle heat a lot better. Um, yeah. But it, it is still kind of a, just because it handles it doesn't mean it will indefinitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so your mileage may vary. You are, you are like applying pressure to them, like just yeah. tightening on the posts, clamping down the lid, like that's squishing mm -hmm, those mm -hmm, O-rings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, but yeah, again, repeated uh, exposure to high heat might wear them out. And you just want to keep an eye on that if that is something uh, you do wind up doing, no chilling in a keg. Um, so, okay, so I, I don't know, I think uh, that's sort of. I think we covered, yeah. Covered the, the basics. Um, if anybody has any questions, put them in the comments, yes. and then we'll make another video answering comments yeah. on our answering comments from the <laughs> comment section videos. It'll all get very meta. <laughs> um, but you do have a good point. Yeah, if anyone um, has anything to add to the conversation, by all means, put it in the comments. Uh, we do read them, and it's also just good to share your knowledge um, with the home brewing community, I think. There's and tell us we're wrong. Uh, we get asked these questions a lot, a lot so we so think about them a lot, yeah. but that doesn't mean that we're right in our thinking. You know, so. so maybe there's a gap there you can fill. Uh, by all means, um, chuck it down in the comments. All right, well, thanks, Ben. See you next time.